Yes, and Water Resources, who's pumped about being here? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We're psyched. <laughs> We're psyched. Okay, so we've got a few things that I'd like to go over first. Um, uh, Dr. Tarberton has issued a um, prescription for his class about the term project proposal, and so I prepared a similar thing and just posted it immediately before class um, onto the class website. Uh, we've been corresponding a little bit between ourselves about this, so I actually took one of the emails and translated onto this page. So this, your term project proposal is due a week from today, on Thursday the 20th of September. Um, this should give your proposed project title, and it's just one page, right? We're not looking for a, a thesis here. If, it doesn't, if your description doesn't even get to one page, it's, you know, don't lose a lot of sleep over it. We're not, we're not looking for a micro dot type here. Uh, proposed project title and your name. It's really important to have a formal title and your name. I, sometimes I get pieces of paper, there, there isn't any, any title at all. It's just like, here's what I'm thinking. Yeah, so, uh, no. It, it could be that I'll recognize in your proposal something that could be, oh, somebody else is working on something like that, you might want to talk to them, you know, that kind of thing. That way I can say, oh, this is what they're talking about, here's what you're talking about, maybe there's a connection here. Um, what's the objective of what you're trying to do? Now, obviously you're going to refine your objective a bit, a bit as you go along, but at least state it as it, is now, as it is now. Thirdly, the data, the data you propose. This is the key thing here. You can't do a project without data. So there's always, you know, people are thinking, oh, I could do this, I could do that, I could do something else. No, no. Think first about where you're going to get the data from and then what you can do with the data that you get, how you can interpret that, right? So today we're going to talk about data sources for uh, GIS and water resources. And we're going to start with some slides. There's a lot of them in that sequence that uh, I sent out last night. And rather than go over them all, you know, and have it like a PowerPoint movie, um, what we want to do is go over some slides at the beginning and then let you have a bit of time to think about this and then we want to ask questions like, oh, I'm thinking about doing a term project on this something, where would I get the data for that? And rather than sort of talking, we'd like you to ask questions and then we'll try to say, oh, if you want to work on that, you know, you go here and, you know, get data. On. That would be an easier way to sort of think the, project, the pro process through, I think. Um, <coughs> And if possible, an outline of steps you need to do to complete the project. In other words, now, it may be that you're, uh, you don't fully understand that yet. So just put that as best you understand it at this moment. Um, you don't have to have a unique research question. In other words, you don't have to be a genius here. This is a term project. It's not a thesis. It's not a dissertation. Uh, if you're already working on something for your thesis or dissertation, it's fine to use that for this project. If you're in water, great. If you're in air pollution or something, well, okay, whatever. We'll, we'll do air pollution. Um, <coughs> so the mantra that I have here is focus first on the data that you can get and then think about the questions that you can answer with those data because the, that's the limiting factor in this process. Um, that way when you come to do your project or present your project, you're not in the position of sort of just giving a general lecture on, yeah, come on down the front here, we've got some, a few extra seats here, we've got enough for everybody now. So this is due a week from today, um, and I'll set up an assignment in Canvas for that. Dr. Tabberton, do you want to add anything to that discussion? Um, sure, so I think the, uh, the point of putting your title and your name on it is good because it actually helps frame your mindset to uh, what you're thinking about and sort of presenting something formally. Um, for the students here, I guess I've got instructions for uh, posting your proposal as a single page PDF document in HydroShare with a very specific name um, and also putting on a very specific uh, keyword tag, GISWR 2018, so that then we can find them all and I will create a web page that then links to those uh, directly. So we'll have one web page, and as you add information to it, it'll go along. But you need to use the same file names as I've prescribed. Otherwise, otherwise I have to go and figure out what file name each student is doing, and to do that for all the students is a bit... So, okay, so, so let if you me use the file names I, I prescribe, it'll just work exactly. Yeah, so let me, David, let me make a suggestion here. Um, I, what I could do is I can compile the project proposals in PDF form that I get here and just 
give you a big file of those. And if you could then post them into the HydroShare system, then we'd have one file proposal set for the whole class and not just two separate systems like we do now. Will that, will that work? Okay. Well, so that's, um, that might mean I'm posting 40 individual ones that all come from Texas, ah. which might be a little bit tedious. So if you want, we, we could have the, the Texas students follow the same instructions as we're following. Uh, so you game to, you're welcome to have those, your students try, and it's, not, it's really not hard. Okay. And there's instructions on the web page. Okay, so um, let, let's, let's revisit the subject next Tuesday, okay? So you're not, this is not, this is not due till Thursday. This so why, why, don't, why don't you go and just point where the instructions are. So if you go to the class web page, go to the, um, your class web page, and then there's a link to the Utah State one. Um, so I think somewhere there you've got a link to mine, okay. that one. Mm -hmm. So then if you go uh, in the general information section, the bottom one is instructions for posting term project related files to HydroShare. Okay. Um, Here we are. And that basically just tells you to sign up for an account. Um, and uh, then uh, this is still all signing up for the account. Um, <laughs> This will show you how to find something. Uh, and so you see this, this was prepared where I had the 2016 instructions. Uh -huh. But then you just create a new resource and you drag and drop the files and they will show up. Okay. Um, well, and you have to make it public. Is this an so exercise? Do we get credit for this thing? <laughs> well, you get credit for your term project. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. so um, Okay, good. So let's let's so well, let's you go. you follow that to see if it's if it's doable, and then you could subject your students to it. Okay. Um, okay. So let me let me do a run through of this. I mean, so this is actually sort of is relevant because HydroShare is a new sharing system that David is the leader of for sharing information about hydrology and water resources. It's kind of like ArcGIS in line for academic hydrology. And so this is, if we do it this way, then well, you'll get a feel for, okay, maybe I could work with this. You know, I could search for things and maybe this can be a, uh, a source of information for my project. And in particular, about Hurricane Harvey, there's lots and lots of data in HydroShare about Harvey. Uh, we, we've, we've uploaded a ton of data about Harvey um, into HydroShare. So that could be an abundant information source, actually, that you could work on for projects that are concerned with that. Okay, so let's, I'll, I'll go through this. I'll be guinea pig and see if I can uh, accomplish this. What I've done in HydroShare is actually search for information. So that part I understand. But the, I'll, I'll st the steps of posting to that I haven't done myself. So this will be a new experience for me. Um, also, we've got uh, a homework exercise that we discussed in class. Uh, let's see. Oops, I don't, maybe I didn't download this. Let me just check here. Uh, we've got a homework exercise that we discussed in class. Data sources? No, I didn't download it. So let me just. That's also on the web page. Yeah, call it up directly. Uh, so just do back on that and you should get to. Yeah, I should get back here. Yep, here we are. So this is the homework exercise uh, that we discussed, and I've created a an assignment for this, and Dr. Tabberton made this up. Do you want to discuss it, David? Just go through this briefly. Um, sure. So, uh, if you, the, the first one just shows a, a map of the US, and then uh, I think on the next page, it gives you a screenshot of what you get from ArcGIS describing a coordinate system. So, this is the US contiguous Albert Equal Area, um, and it gives the various. Uh, parameters. So it says put a large dot at the intersection of the central meridian reference latitude. So if you go back to the map, you'll, well you can read what the central meridian and reference latitude are and just draw a dot on the map where they are, um, big enough for us to see. Um, and then uh, what, uh, well then it also asks you to label uh, a number, number of things. Well, um, did we lose a? F we, it looks like we might have lost some content here, because I thought I think it also asks that you draw the um, 
the two standard parallels and draw the central meridian. Um, and I'm not seeing that in the write-up here. Oh, we'll, we'll fix it so and maybe, repost this. That might have got lost in the editing, so we might have some fixing to do. Okay. Um, but then it asks things like, what surface property does the Elba's projection uh, preserve? So if you remember from the class last time, what Earth datum is used with the coordinate system, uh, you could read and find in the, in the screen grab what the Earth datum is. Um, so... Uh, then the geographic coordinates, so we're giving geographic coordinates of uh, Salt Lake City and New York um, and uh, asking you to uh, calculate the coordinates of those in decimal degrees, um, so the conversion from degrees, minutes, seconds to decimal degrees, in other words, involving dividing the minutes by 60, the seconds by 3,600, which is 60 times 60, and... Uh, and getting a decimal expression for uh, latitude and longitude. Well, we'll do that in exercise um, two on Tuesday, so don't worry about that for now. Right. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, then calculating uh, the distance in kilometers that New York is east of Salt Lake City along a latitude uh, parallel. So remember we had the slide in the last lecture about calculating the distance east to west, which involved the radius of the Earth and the latitude. Um, so basically to exercise that formula, um, determine the distance that Salt Lake City is north of the latitude of the origin. And this is again another north-south uh, distance calculation. Uh, calculate the great circle distance between New York and Salt Lake City, assuming a spherical Earth. So we gave the great circle formula, which uh, oh. is a little bit tricky to uh, <laughs> implement, but it's a good thing to work through carefully. Um, then uh, comment on the differences. So you won't get exactly the same answers. So uh, there are differences due to things like the distortion associated with the projection, the approximation of a spherical Earth rather than a spheroidal Earth. Um, so uh, those will, you won't get exactly the same answers. Uh, then, uh, then effectively to do that in ArcGIS to check your answers. So uh, you can create a table in Excel, and I've sort of laid out what it should look like, but I've blanked out the decimal points, um, of the latitude and longitude of uh, Salt Lake City, New York City, and then I've given instructions for how you can import that into ArcGIS so that you've got two dots on the map, and then you can determine the distance uh, between them uh, based on the dots. And you can also... Uh, add to the table that you've imported the uh, x and y coordinates uh, in the projected coordinate system and then use the Pythagoras theorem that we spoke about last time to calculate the distance. Um, so that's what this about reconciling your answers uh, bit is all about. Then I said, uh, remember we spoke about UTM uh, uh, coordinate systems. Well, figure out which UTM zone each of these is in. So the UTM zones are six degrees wide. They start from the minus 180 longitude. So the first zone is minus 180 to minus 174. The second is minus 174 to minus uh, 168. Keep on going around to figure out which is UTM zone uh, Salt Lake City and New York City is. I think Dr. Maidman in class told you which one uh, Austin is in, which was what, 14? 14, yeah. 14. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, Salt Lake will be a smaller number. New York will be a larger number. Uh, so you guys can figure that out. Actually, um, strictly speaking, we have 14N because the north of the equator zones are separate from the south of the equator zones. But anyway, we're, we're so, mm -hmm. so I think that, that's all for the, the first homework part. And then there's another little one going on the next page. So um, if you look at the national map, and that's one of the data sources we'll be talking about today, um, you can download digital elevation model data at a number of different resolutions. Uh, the coarser resolution is one arc second. Um, so an arc second is a 60th of an arc minute. An arc minute is a 60th of a degree. So it's one 3,600th of a degree. And... Uh, 
we've, we asked you to basically figure out the length in the east, west, and north, south direction of this rectangle. So this is again going back to those length calculations, assuming the Earth is a sphere. Um, and you'll find that this uh, cell is, um, when it's represented in geographic coordinates, is actually a rectangle because its uh, north-south distance is longer than the east-west distance. You can figure each of those out and uh, then work out the area. And what you'll find is that uh, the, because Logan is further north, that's why I've given the latitudes here, you'll get the east-west distance is different in Logan than uh, Austin, but you should get the same north-south distance uh, for both of them. And then you can work out the area as a product of the east-west and north-south distances. Thank you. Yes. And so will the, <coughs> will the square be bigger in Logan than in Austin or smaller? Who says larger? Everything's smaller. <laughs> okay, larger. Who says smaller? Okay, smaller winds, because as you go north, the meridians come together, so that the AB and the CD distances are smaller in Logan than they are in Austin. So as you go down, you go like this. Um, so that's what you'll find. Or else we say everything is bigger in Texas. <laughs> Especially the hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when I came to Texas in 1980, the the question that, that was burning on everybody's minds was who shot J.R.? And this is the, the, the when I, my image of Texas, when I came to Texas, was the program, television program Dallas, you know, with <laughs> Sue Ellen and, you know, J.R. and all these sort of <laughs> people swanning around in big cars and huge houses. So, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so also, a, a, sort of topical question right now is Hurricane Florence. So this is Hurricane Florence. This is the forecast as it existed um, when we had class on Tuesday. Uh, at that time, it was projected to hit the coast of North Carolina and to go into uh, Virginia. Uh, yesterday, 11 o'clock Wednesday, by that point, the forecast had shifted south. Uh, and also there's this perception that the hurricane is going to go along the coast, which is not good, because that means it's resident for a time when it can sweep water in, inland. It's going to produce more flooding for sure if that happens. And this morning, this is the projection. So now a little bit more inland, not quite so much uh, resident on the coast, which is good. You want to get hurricanes off the ocean as quickly as possible. That's the message. And now the perception is it's going to turn north, or at least they've got a longer range forecast, or the forecast is now tracking the motion of the hurricane further inland uh, than it did earlier. Um, but there's no question that this is, uh, the uh, H stands here for uh, hurricane with wind force between 75 and 110 miles an hour, and previously uh, the M stands for major hurricane, which means wind velocities of over uh, 110 miles an hour. So one of the good things is this has diminished a bit. I mean, the, the hurricane is, is strengthened. So is this going to be a Harvey? No, I don't think this is going to be a Harvey. Uh, this is not going to re be resident along the coast for long enough to do that. Uh, it's also not the strength of winds force that Harvey was. Um, so I started checking some of the forecasting for the Carolina coast. This is from the National Water Model. It's, you know, everything's being computed and updated and tracking these different forecasts as they are uh, developed. And I just picked one river here, uh, the, um, this particular river, which is Cape Fear River uh, in near Wilmington, North Carolina. And the forecast that, that, that was as of yesterday was for about 160,000 cubic feet per second on Sunday evening. And that was... In Harvey, that was about the maximum flow that we got, and the, the largest river in the state, uh, which was the the highest flow, in the, was in the Sabine River, and it was about 160,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, so there's some really, really huge flows that are going to happen. And one of the in animations that... Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, one of the anima animations that uh, was worked out after Harvey was the... Uh, the forecast of the rain as it was coming in off of the Gulf and then as it penetrated inland and turned around, came over towards Houston. And this is, the, on the left is the forecast, 
and on the right is what actually happened. This is the National Water Model analysis, the analysis model. So this one is tracking what happened, the, the other one is tracking what was expected to happen. And so this is from several days out in the Gulf. So what the National Water Model is providing is a perspective of what's going to happen on the land once these things get a, come, on, come onto the coast that underlies or goes along with the hurricane forecast that we were just looking at from the National Hurricane Centre. Um, so uh, what the research was that we were engaged in while we were at the, well, not research, what the action was, we were figuring out for our state what would be the flooding impacts of this rain once it got on shore. And you can see some of the GIS data underneath this. The, you can see these lines here. That's the flow pr calculations on the river lines in the National Water Model that underlie the, uh, the National Water Model. And those calculations are you know, all now being done uh, for the Carolinas for, for Florence. So, yeah, this is a very uh, dramatic moment, actually. It's <laughs> when I was at the State Operations Center, uh, well, one night I came home, it was like Saturday night, I think, I wrote, I wrote the faculty, my EWRE faculty, a le uh, an email about one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I said, our state is facing a catastrophe and we can't stop it. And I just pray for the souls of my fellow Texans here. Um, and that's what happened. I, I, I got some information this morning actually from the city of Houston. A new study has been done for Houston that showed that there were 218,000 buildings damaged just within the city of Houston. That's not even all of Harris County. And of those, 58% were not even in the floodplain. <laughs> so almost 60% of the damage was away from where the re re recognized creeks were. Only 23% of the damaged buildings were inside the 100-year floodplain. About another 19% were between the 100 and 500 year floodplain. 60% weren't even inside of a floodplain. So th these kind of catastrophic events are raising real questions about preparedness, about ubiquity, and a, a about where risk is, and about how to prepare for that risk. And these kind, and in, in, in my opinion, what we should be thinking about for the future is the simulation of storm events like this, and understanding how our communities are going to be resilient against events like this. That it's not just about, oh, I'm okay because I'm away from a creek or something like that. Okay, well, so much for the topical stuff here. Um, what else? Homework, term project. Okay, so let's talk about data sources. So this lecture is all about data sources. There's several different resources uh, that we prepared to help you to pre uh, with this. One of them is a list of data sources. Uh, which I went through and checked that all the links work. Uh, we've kept this list up to date um, over the years. We've <coughs> added a few new sources this year. So, this, so you can go through this. It's a PDF document, and you can just click on something. Uh, for example, Dr. Tarberton referred to the national map. So you can say, oh, okay, I can go get the national map, and you know, here it is. So uh, this is a list that helps you to just poke around and say, now, where could I get information for my project? Um, another thing that we've got here is a description, just a synopsis, which is um, sort of a narrative description about, especially about the um, primary hydrology data sources uh, that are available. So you can read that and follow up a little bit more about that. Um, and then we've got this rather large uh, um, set of slides here, which what we're going to do is start off actually near the end because those are specific to particular regions. So uh, let's see, where is that one? Yeah, so let me just say a few words here about, about Texas. So in Texas, we have an organization called the Texas Natural Resource Information System. And this is really cool. Not many states have one of these. Uh, and it's basically a hub for the collection and storage of data about the natural environment of the state. And it's also got administrative regions and other things. I noticed when I looked at it that there's lots of lots of new LIDAR data that's becoming available. So if you want to translate 
the work that we're doing with elevation models, which will be with the National Elevation Data Set, into a LIDAR analysis for some area. You'll find lots of data sources here. And actually, I've downloaded the LIDAR data from TenRIS, and it works quite well. You draw, draw a box and say, hey, I, I want the data here, and <laughs> it shows up. It's pretty cool. Um, and the other source that's good for sort of larger scale water resources studies is the Texas Water Development Board. And they have things like maps of aquifers and maps of watersheds and things like that. Sort of general perspective stuff that's helpful uh, for just general statements about water resources. Um, uh, this is a, uh, the archive about Hurricane Harvey. It's rather a gorgeous slide. Actually, it was prepared by my colleague David Arctor. Uh, for a presentation that he made in Port Aransas a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is some of the uh, ma in, uh, flood mapping that was done for Harvey. And there's a rather beautiful um, story map. So I talked about story maps and the capacity that story maps have for being able to convey information. And you can see there's a series of tabs here about storm track, flood data, hydrology, transportation, addresses, and so on, so that you, you can click on a tab and then look at the map um, and then you can click here and say, this is hosted on HydraShare, and blah, 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 blah. So it takes you to the place where the data, that particular data set is stored. Um, and, well, David, this is your slide. So will you, do you want to pick up here? So uh, this is the, um, so in terms of putting together this collection uh, of uh, the story map, uh, we had a, uh, project funded by the National Science Foundation, basically following Hurricane Harvey, Dr. Maidment uh, made the case. He said, well, we can really have a great set of data for study to help uh, prevent this. We should make it publicly available. Uh, HydraShare is a system operated by Quasi for the hydrology research community to uh, make data available for, uh, for research. So uh, long story short, we uh, got some funding from the National Science Foundation Quasi has set up uh, this web page that just describes uh, the project in brief and links to things like the story map that you just saw and links to all of the other resources in HydraShare that uh, have been assembled uh, with a lot of the work from David Arctor, who was with uh, Dr. Maidman. So your name has to be David to do work on these <laughs> projects. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, has, he, he's, he's done the sort of heavy lifting and assembling all of this data, putting it in an interpretable format, uh, and uh, building, writing the story map and loading it into HydraShare and writing the fairly extensive descriptions so that uh, it can be used by the research community. So this slide describes that. And then I guess the next slide is, uh, this is just, um, the collection. So uh, you're able to, in the HydraShare, make a collection, which is really just a listing of resources. Um, so uh, this uh, will show you that the collection was uh, prepared by uh, David Arctor with contributions from the gang of people up at the top. Um, and uh, the sort of domain that it covers is, uh, is that area. And that domain is quite large because uh, we've also got in there the the hurricane track uh, that's uh, that's involved from when it uh, from when it started until um, where it until um, where it hit. Although most of the data is focused around the, the Houston area. So, uh, so do you want me to go through all of these Utah slides now? Well, yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, it just seems like this is a sort of specialist subject that. Um, that people are not going to be too familiar with. So why don't we do this, and then we'll come back to the general questions. So, um, so there's a sequence of slides here that go through um, some of the data available for, uh, for this area. Colorado Basin River Forecast Center is one of, uh, what's it, about seven or eight river forecast centers that are around the country uh, that provide uh, water supply forecasts and uh, real-time flooding forecasts. And um, at some level, this may be uh, sort of partly superseded by the national water model, but I think that the local river forecast centers are still going to have to effectively provide the local interpretation and guidance, drawing information from the national water model, as well as drawing information from the local information they have. And this shows all the places where the 
Colorado River Forecast Center forecast stream flow. So you could go and click on one of these dots and find what the stream flow forecast in the Logan River is. Uh, and this is uh, the sort of information you can get. So uh, who here can tell me where that picture was taken? So that's uh, just below Second Dam, up Logan River. That's actually where the uh, Logan High Park Canal takes water out of the out of the river to go and feed the irrigation. And this was in 2017, right about the time where we had um, a peak flow of uh, close to 1,500 uh, CFS. So it's kind of small compared to some of the flows we just heard about from uh, from. Hurricane Florence, but it's a, a smallish river, and it's still like quite a powerful flow you can see there. And you can see at the top here that uh, you, you get forecasts that show things like uh, the sort of flood stage, or danger <coughs> stage, and flood stage, and uh, the dots are the sort of forecasts, as it were. And then you also get projections ahead. I think this screenshot was captured a few days before uh, it was sort of predicted to peak, and it was saying that it could go as high as 2,500 if we had a really sort of bad rainstorm right, right at that time. Um, but the expectation was it wasn't going to go over 1,750. And so this, I think so, this slide has an interesting story behind it, and that is flooding in the mountains in the west is a product of snowmelt. So that you can see here, this, the time scale here is April, May, June. See how the flow's increasing slowly because of snow melt? So the, the size of the snowpack actually determines the size of the flood. The flood goes on for weeks. <laughs> so yeah, this is not something that's going to be over and gone in a few days. So this is a whole different hydrologic regime here in the West and a different sense of information that's needed to inform studies about flooding um, in the West compared with the hurricane like what we have in North Carolina. So we have one flood per year. <laughs> yeah, that's true in a sense, right? The snow melt um, yeah. So, this, so what, in, important information from that is uh, from the snowtail system. So this uh, shows the states that are involved in uh, measuring uh, snow in the uh, snowtail system operated by the NRCS or Natural Resources Conservation Service. <coughs> um, and let's go to the next slide because I think there's some more interesting information there. Um, so there's the one for the map for Utah. So you can see where the individual dots involved are. And there's a sort of cluster of them around Salt Lake City where there's uh, a number of ski resorts and also um, the, the sort of potential for, for flooding coming off the mountains is, um, is a consideration. And then there's also a few up here uh, near where we are in, in Logan. Um, you might ask, what is at a snowtail site? So let's go to the next slide. And let's see if that's the one. So this is a photograph uh, late in the season of uh, one of the snowtail sites, um, where you have uh, this sort of snows mostly receded. In this case, it's only sort of half covering the center. That sort of gray thing at the bottom is uh, a snow pillow. It's basically a large rubberized uh, um, contain a bit like a waterbed that holds antifreeze and that pressure that antifreeze is measured in a manometer in a little uh, housing uh, that's, that's outside the picture. So as the snowpack builds up, the weight on that uh, snow pillow increases and from the weight you can get a sense of how much uh, the, the snow is or how in terms of mass, which is measured in a quantity referred to as water equivalent. So if you think of how much water are you going to get when you melt the, s the snow? You've snows of, of quite variable density, but what we're interested in, how much water it, uh, it holds if it was all to melt. And that's the, that's the water equivalent, and that's the depth of water that would result if it was all to, to melt, and that's really the mass just divided by the, the density of water. Off to the left, you can see a really tall rain gauge. So it's unusual for rain gauges to be quite as tall as that. Um, and uh, you see it around the top of it, uh, there's um, those sort of baffles, and those are intended to uh, sort of dampen the wind so that the snowflakes, as they fall down, will settle into that gauge. That gauge has uh, got antifreeze at the bottom, so the snowflakes that fall in will then melt and 
it's tall enough so that the water that can accumulate through the season without it having to be uh, gone and emptied or anything like that. And it's also tall enough so that it's hopefully not going to get buried by a really deep snowpack. Um, so, uh, and then they'll go and service that every year and sort of drain out the, the water and antifreeze and refresh it um, ready for the next season. And you'd see a bunch of uh, radio telemetry stuff where all the data is sent back to um, a, uh, a base station actually via an interesting mechanism it bounces it off uh, meteor bursts um, and uh, there's also things like uh, measuring the depth of the snow sonically uh, and some other sensors that are recorded there. Let me just mention briefly, uh, we, I showed at the beginning of the semester that Dr. Talbot was <coughs> elected as a fellow of the American Geophysical Union which is a great honor for him for scientific hydrology this year. And two of his contributions that he was elected for were the hydro shear system and that we were just discussing and a special model that he's developed for snow melt um, in the mountains that's now widely used and adopted. So thank you for your contributions in that area, David. This is an area where he's contributed yeah. to the fundamental science. Well, Got appreciate it. it. So yeah. there's just a little bit of some of the measuring of the snow uh, so there's a, a lot of hand measurement as well to effectively uh, calibrate and uh, verify what the snow pillows are measuring. So what you can see they're doing there is stick a tube into the snow uh, called a federal snow sampler, twist it in so that it catches a bit of the mud at the bottom, pull it out, um, and then weigh that, uh, weigh that mm -hmm. snow. And he's, he's measuring, he's weighing it on a spring gauge. And again, the weight, uh, together with the diameter of the tube will tell you what the snow water equivalent is. And generally it's about like an inch to a foot. So one foot of snow yields one inch of water roughly. Yeah. Um, I guess so. That's the Colorado River Forecast Center again. Um, yeah, these are... F so these are the sort of uh, graphs of uh, how snow water equivalent builds up and then ablates uh, as later in the season. So. This is the sort of hydrograph, if you will, of snow water equivalent on the ground. Um, this is uh, one of the snow tail stations up uh, Logan Canyon, the Tony Grove Lake Station. And you'll see that uh, 2016 was a real, uh, 2017, I guess, is the green one, was a, the really high year last year. Uh, I guess I never know whether the symbols are on the right or the left. It must be the 2017. Yeah, the green, green is the 17. 2016 is the, is the red, which is a, a low year. And you can see the sort of average is uh, what is the blue and the purple, if you do a mean or a median. Yeah. So this is kind of like flood in the mountains, you could say, at some level, yeah. the green lines. Yeah. So then one of the new ways of measuring snow is actually... Uh, with LIDAR. So uh, we'll be learning a little bit about using LIDAR to measure topography, but what they'll, they'll do is they'll fly LIDAR in the dry season or in the, in the summer when there's uh, no snow on the ground, and then they'll fly LIDAR at peak snow accumulation, and based on the difference you can figure out the depth of, uh, the, depth of the snow. And there's an airborne snow observatory that's operated by JPL and uh, is used for forecasting in some of these watersheds um, in California. And the data is put in a NASA DAC. And then you can also get uh, gridded data. So this is a model actually running it, uh, and I think the model is based on the UEB model that uh, Dr. Maidman just mentioned, the Utah Energy Balance model, uh, that uh, runs across the, um, the continental US and uh, sort of keeps track of uh, the buildup of snow on about a one kilometer grid and it uh, comes out of uh, a center called the National Operational Hydrologic Remote Sensing Center which is now a part of the National Water Center organization and you can go to that website and get these uh, this gridded snow data if you, you're interested in a project, project that uh, perhaps is the sort of distribution of snow. Okay, so this is the Utah equivalent of the Texas uh, GIS data, so it's uh, the Automated Geographic uh, Research or Resources Center, so gis.utah.gov, and uh, you can get all sorts of Utah-specific <coughs> data there. Um, 
There is also uh, the, I guess this is just showing one of the maps you can download from that uh, GIS portal um, with a pretty interesting uh, color scheme. There's also the Utah Geological Survey. So this is different from the U.S. Geological Survey. Utah has its own geological survey, and I imagine other states perhaps do too, but it puts out uh, geologic maps. So if you're interested in the, the geology, and there's a pretty interesting geology here due to the mountains and the, um, the internally draining lakes, uh, so there's a lot of information available there. Uh, what's next? So I've got a few uh, slides about uh, Western regional data. So uh, the Western Regional Climate Center provides climate data. Um, it's actually based out of Reno uh, as part of uh, University of Nevada, Reno. That, um, and uh, yeah, if you're interested in sort of climate information, uh, you, you might be able to get the, the data you need there. Um, if you're interested in the Bear River, uh, there's a Bear River watershed uh, information system that uh, was actually started as a project. This is one of some of the early precursors when we were starting to get into hydrologic information systems and explore how to, uh, how to uh, publish uh, watershed information over the web, and uh, this website was established then. Um, what's... Okay, so there's a few slides here about, uh, from MODIS. And um, MODIS is a, is a NASA satellite. If you read the text right at the bottom of that, <coughs> uh, you'll see it's worldview.earthdata.nasa.gov is the website. So there you can actually select the specific MODIS image for a specific day and see what the satellite is, uh, is telling us. And what's really interesting is to look at the Great Salt Lake uh, from 2011 up to 2017, uh, and you can see that the whole part to the east, the right, uh, that's Farmington Bay, is now um, effectively an exposed uh, lake bed with just a little sliver of a uh, river going through that. Um, so uh, the Great Salt Lake is actually at close to its record low right now due to um, the sort of dry drought we've had, and uh, stream, stream inflows being uh, less, than, less than usual. So that's another topic that gets really interesting to study. And then the last one, I just went and looked at uh, what I could see from the California fires. So I looked back, and uh, 8th of August this year, you can see these big fires burning in California, and you can see the smoke extending all the way across uh, to Utah. Um, and those of the those here will know that we had some really uh, horrible days here. We just go outside, and the whole air was thick of smoke. And then you can see in this satellite image, it was coming all the way from fires in California. Okay, thank you. Is, this, is that the big fire up at Red? Uh, where was it? Red, the big fire in California. Santa Rosa had the big fire. Yeah, that's north of San Francisco. I'm not a, yeah, that's there. That, mm -hmm. So that might have been the yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so let's, um, let's continue on now, and we'll see if we can respond to questions that you have, and, and you, Tara, for the students also. What, do, what kind of data are you interested in and looking for? Precipitation. So somebody says precipitation. If you speak okay. up, your voice will be heard. Precipitation, okay. Um, so let's. So there's a system that's available at Quasi uh, that David Tabberton and I worked on. That it's called data.quasi.org. And you can say, okay, oh, I'd like to find data on precipitation, and you, you need to zoom in to some location where you want to do that. So let's suppose we want to find out uh, well, precipitation in, in the Houston area just for fun. So what you do is you say, I want all data services, and let's, I'm just going to put here uh, USGS because that's I happen to know there's uh, USGS data here. So I say save, and what keywords do I want? I think I'd like to have data about precipitation. Okay, precipitation, say save, 
and says all dates, or you can give a specific date range. I search for data about Harvey, for example, so I put in the date range for Harvey, and you can say search now, no time series. Whoops, that didn't work too well. Let me uh, <coughs> take Streamflow. It doesn't have any time series of um, precipitation, but I know there's time series of Streamflow available there. Let's see, discharge. So discharge, save, and say search now. And here's all the discharge stations that are in the Houston area. And then you can say, gosh, I, you know, I'm interested in maybe this one. And you can, you can download data from individual sites or for collections of them and just get an Excel file. So this, this is a system. It has, um, it has a number of parameters that you can search for readily. Um, in fact, there's about 100 d different data systems that are harmonized in this uh, data, there's all these, this 100 here. So there's all these different observation networks all over the country. So this is a project that Dr. Tarleton and I worked on, and we invented a language called the Water Markup Language that the US Geological Survey and other organizations adopted so that now there's this, this one internet of water thing, and the data.quasi.org gives you access to that. Um, there's other sources of precipitation data also that we've um, shown in the slide sets. Um, so if you come so to slide 44. Slide 44, yeah. okay, thank you. So uh, at the National Centers for Environmental Information, there's a section here called climate.gov, and if you go there, you can get quite a lot of information about uh, long-term precipitation records in gridded form and also in a point form. Uh, this is uh, gridded precipitation information, and this information from the uh, is from actually originally from Oregon State University in a program called PRISM is actually loaded into ArcGIS Online. So this precipitation map, if you, if you sign up in ArcGIS Online and say uh, precipitation, then you'll get the information that comes from PRISM actually. And this is a annual and monthly precipitation map on average across the country. So if you want to do studies about you know, just how much rain is there on average over this region, you can use that. Um, there's so they will also give information on specific months in each year. And they've also gotten, recently they've post started posting specific daily precipitation. So they're starting to get into the business of actually using their methods to, uh, to produce time series uh, in a gridded form. Okay. Uh, and then there's the National Water Information System from the USGS that has streamflow and precipitation information, you know, with stations all over the country like what I was showing you. Actually, I like the quasi system for accessing the USGS data because it, it shows where the stations are. Otherwise, you have to go on a sort of a, 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 a bit of a random search to find out where the stations are. Um, here's the ArcGIS online, and here's, yeah, so I happen to have done a search for precipitation in ArcGIS online, and here are some of the responses that I got. So here's precipitation maps of various kinds, some of them for real-time precipitation, actually. This GLDAS precipitation stands for Global Land Data Assimilation System, is a global precipitation map that's done on a monthly basis all the way uh, from 2000 onwards here. Okay, what else, what other kind of data do you want to get besides precipitation? Yes? Groundwater? Groundwater, okay, groundwater. So that's, let's go back up to, so where, groundwater for Texas? Ground, groundwater for Texas, okay, well, groundwater for Texas, this is this I know. So uh, there it's best to go to the website of the Texas Water Development Board. That's where the big repository of groundwater information is for the state, and they've got a relational database there that can be uh, brought into, uh, at least the table, can be uh, as a um, database table can be brought into ArcGIS, and then you've got you know, hundred, over 100,000 wells. It's a very uh, extensive database. Yes? Air pollution measurements. Air pollution measurements. Ah, air pollution. I don't know much about air pollution. That's uh, Dr. Tarleton. Ah, you're, you're the smoke guy. You're going all about <laughs> air pollution measurements. <laughs> I mean, I. There's a, in Utah, there are websites like um, air.utah.gov, I think, that uh, might have that. Um, there was the MODIS imagery, uh, which will show you uh, the sort of plumes of fires. Um, I, I mean, I, beyond that, I don't have a lot of uh, um, direct, direct knowledge. There's no slides in our sets with air pollution. 
So let's, so let's go here and say, okay, I want to search living atlas content for air pollution. Anything on air now? Okay, so air pollution. Ah, look at that. USA EPA air quality data, air quality monitors, air pollution, non-attainment areas. Non non-attainment means you non non-attainment EPA standards. So, yeah. So the, there's also a website called airnow.gov. What's that, air? It uh, looks like airnow.gov. It looks like it's part of the EPA. Okay. And in, I guess, city state, Austin, Texas. Yeah, yeah, sure. Good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I would say, um, Paris, uh, for air pollution, I'd go first to ArcGIS Online. I think that's going to be this. So one of the really, the benefits of this is that somebody else has spent a lot of time aggregating information. And even if the kind of data that you want, maybe you want time series that show, you know, data measured at a gauge or something, you're going to get an index in there about, you know, where things are measured and some pointers as to where to go to. Yes. In groundwater anywhere in the world. Ah, there's a thing, which actually we don't list in our data sources, which, but there is a um, global groundwater data center. It's actually based in the Netherlands. There we go. Global groundwater information system. There we go. Start there, yeah. So, the um, the United Nations has data centers for different kinds of information. Groundwater is one. There's one for precipitation, global precipitation climatology center. There's one for runoff, global runoff data center, and there's one for water quality. So there are global aggregations of data at these different data centers. Most of them are in Germany. This one's in in the Netherlands. Any other things? Yes. It's not specifically hydrology related, huh? but. Good. Digital elevation models. Digital elevation models. Oh well, yeah, you come to the right, right, right place here. <laughs> we know DEMs. Yeah, so we've got a pretty extensive um, uh, narrative here about how to get digital elevation model data. So the national elevation data set availability. So that you can go to the national map actually, and so the national map for the United States gives. Uh, data availability in different spe uh, data specifications. Um, do you want the US or is it global? Well, I'm doing research in Puerto Rico, so... Puerto Rico, okay. Puerto Rico yes, yes, US. Puerto Rico is part of the US, yes. <laughs> Sometimes we doubt that, but anyway, it's there. So yes, Puerto Rico is definitely covered in the National Elevation data set. Um, there's also uh, a number of sources of global elevation data. Um, let's see, there's the SRTM. So this is probably the... Mo whoops. This is probably the most well-known uh, uh, international source of the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission I mentioned. There was a, uh, a radar unit out the bay and another one on an arm that went around the Earth and measured the topography of the Earth. And I checked actually in this website last night and they now have released the 30 meter data, which was the military version of this data, uh, for public. This wasn't, was kept behind the scenes for quite a while. But this comes from the NASA JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, there's hydro, hydro sheds derived from that. In other words, watersheds that are derived for the Earth. So if you want to do a project in, I don't know, Guatemala or somewhere, somebody's already been there and figured out roughly where the drainage areas are. Um, and really beautiful cartography, huh? World Wildlife Fund. This is the Amazon. Um, this is GTOPO 30, uh, the, a one kilometer elevation model of the Earth. Now, this is good if you want to look at a big region. You know, I want to look at the Himalayas or something. Detailed data are hard to work with there, and one kilometer model actually gives you a sort of a big picture view that's quite helpful. This was the first global elevation model that existed, started about 20 years ago. And then drainage has been derived from that uh, for all the river basins and of the Earth. Um, that's soils. Okay, let's move on to something else, yes? There was a question of a student here. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. The location of dams. Location of dams. Ah, that's a good question. So there is something called 
the National Inventory of Dams. So let's see what we can find out about that because this has been a uh, this has been a somewhat controversial data set. You might think, ah, look at that, National Inventory of Dams. National Inventory of Dams, okay, we've got lots of lovely pictures. Select your organization to enter the, okay, so I am a academia, okay, there you go. National, the National Inventory of Dams is now available, okay, go. Blah, blah, most populated, blah, blah, blah. Mm. This doesn't look too easy. This is not a point-and-click system, it seems like. Maybe it's by stuff. <laughs> it's from the Army Corps of Engineers. So. Yeah. yeah, the reason yeah. why this has been controversial is that dams are considered national security um, information. You, know, you, you damage a dam and you can affect the population. And so this, some, of, some of the attribute fields of these, of these dams uh, are considered, it's considered private information. So here we are. So here we are. Total dams here in Texas, 7,395. I'm not sure how to get the, these data, but you, know, you can see there's a big inventory here. Yes? Mm -hmm. Water access. Water access. You mean for water supply or like how to get to rivers or? So like where people are in relation to water, is that what you mean? Or? Uh-huh. Okay, so uh, so the question is how yeah, you know, how much um what's the access to drinking water is really the, the, the nature of the question. Um so the EPA has something called the safe safe drinking water. <coughs> now, it probably would take some digging to um, go into this, but I would start here. So this is the, so the, there are sort of three basic um, or four basic acts that protect the environment. The Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, and this one, the Safe Drinking Water Act. So all of the activity that deals with safe drinking water comes under this, and we have a state program for that also. So. In, in the state of Texas, the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality regulates the Safe, well, the safe Drinking Water Act in Texas. So there's, there's data specific for Texas that are available from the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality. Now, there's some restrictions on that because, you know, so drinking water sources, again, there's some public health, national security things that are associated with that. So you can't just say, oh, here's all the dots where people can get their drinking water supply, and oh, by the way, you know, I'm a terrorist and I'm going to go and put poison in there. So, yeah, there's some limitations about that. Um, you know, obviously, here in Texas, the water supply for the colonias in South Texas has been an issue, so there's special studies about that, too. Let's, let's give the ch students from Utah a chance here. So, any questions? So, who's got a, a term project uh, out of the state of Utah in mind? Or in the state of Utah. <laughs> well, let, let me, what's your project? Yeah, what What are you thinking of? I'm thinking about uh, finding uh, different dams on the Bear River, and then try to see the water quality upstream and downstream uh, in relationship with uh, fish habitats. So it's fish habitat and dams and water quality upstream and downstream of them. Okay, so what I would do. Um, is uh, I would use the National Inventory of Dams to look for dam locations in Utah, and I'd use the Quasi system for searching. You can find nutrients. There's some water quality data accessible from that system, so I would use that to get a quick cut as to where you could um, get information. But is that in the Bear River area? I mean, this Bear River information system seems like it would be relevant for that too. Whole basin, the whole uh, Bear River basin. Yes, so there's a, that Bear River Observatory that Dr. Tarverton was talking about. I know the specific measurements they're dealing with water quality and water temperature and things like that that are accessible from that system. One of the things that's really impressive about the um, projects from Utah is that they're really good on natural environment there. That's the land grant institution for Utah, and so they've got a strong program in agriculture and natural resources. Anything else from Utah? Anything else? 
Less than a week to go till you've got to have a okay. topic. Okay, I know that. Well, they're, they're, they're going to think, think of okay. something. <laughs> any, more, any more here from Texas? Other data, yes. Okay, so there are four. Uh, the first is called the analysis model. Um, so let's go to, uh, yeah, so actually what, you might think of doing something with Florence, right? The, the, we're in a crisis here. The, this could be an interesting, you can sort of gather data in real time like what I've been doing for the forecasting. So if you go to water, uh, water.noaa.gov slash map, that's how you get to the national water model and you sign off your firstborn child and say, yes, I'm willing to pledge that I won't do anything really, really bad. Um, so if you pick a river, uh, this doesn't look good, let's pick this one. So um, you can say, I want the national water model and uh, so the stream, an stream analysis here, you can get stream flow and say, oops, and I'll get a chart here. Yeah, open the forecast chart. So I can open a forecast chart here. So there are four forecasts that you see here. Analysis, which is, uh, which is coming up to the present. So this is like coming up to wherever we are. I don't see the difference. There's a red color and an orange color here. Yeah, so the analysis is the orange, and then the red is this short range forecast here. Then there's a medium range. So there's forecast. been a considerable increase already. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So you, so you can see the effect of, uh, yeah, you can see the effect of the hurricane already. So where are we now? We're now at the 13th. So we're, at, yeah, we're, we're right at that point. See where the orange goes to red? That means it's shifting from the analysis. Uh, sorry, that's, yeah, there's orange and this is the red part here. This is the forecast. The medium range forecast, if you just say rebuild, looks further out into the future. So now it's got, whoops, there's a bunch of wobbly things here about you know, rain bands and impacts of the hurricane that are varying through time. But still, you know, there's a very large flows that are coming up here. And then there's a long range forecast, which goes way out into the future. And you can see that this long range forecast isn't consistent with the medium range ones. And that's because they use different weather models. So there's actually three different weather models, one involved with a short range forecast, one with a medium range forecast, and one with a long-range forecast. That's why they look different here. There was another question here. Uh, what would be the format of this data? I mean, um, can we get them in spreadsheets or...? Yes, or so, so there's actually a quasi app for this, right? David, this on the uh, quasi... There is a... There is a, there is a it's actually a, an app that's linked to HydroShare. So if you go to uh, hydroshare.org, um, and uh, click on the apps uh, that will appear across the top. So, um, so we've got a little warning there that says, uh, be careful because Hydrogen is actually hosted at Renzi, so if they have a power outage, it goes down. But the National Water Model Forecast Viewer, that uh, will get you into uh, viewing the forecast. It's going to want you to sign in. Um, But it'll, it'll allow you to download the, the data in comma-separated variable format and uh, also water ML format. Um, and uh, you can then uh, you, you can, you can, uh, then work with it. Yes, and another nice thing is that you can add a watershed. So if you've got, like, I want data from a particular watershed, you can have a shape file of that and then add this to the map and then say it'll start selecting data out of that watershed. Yes, so the latency, that's a good question. So <laughs> latency doesn't play that much of a role for the medium range and long range forecast because it's measured in hours, not days. But the latency is about three hours. So in other words, from the time that a new measurement's made to the time that it influences the next forecast is three hours. Um, it takes about two hours to do the weather part, well, two hours and 10 minutes and so on, and about 30 minutes to do the hydrology part. The hydrology actually takes much less time than what forecasting the weather does. But when I, say, when I say the latency is three hours, that's for the short range forecast, which is an hourly time steps for 18 hours ahead. So it takes, you know, there's a significant, latency plays a role, significant role for that, for sure. 
Well, if you're doing forecasts from the national water model, what you'll find is that sometimes, even the forecast that you saw with the flow going up and down like that, it's very much influenced by what the weather forecast is. And sometimes the simulation of the weather model will go <laughs> like this, and then it goes <laughs> like that. Yeah, and you get real significant differences. So it's better to speak about the, the most expected forecast. And I might take several of them and put them together and say, this is what we really, you know, here's the middle of the range of a variable quantity, because it really is an uncertain system. Yes? Level of risk of flood, you mean like the uh, area where flooding is likely to be higher versus lower? Yes, that's called the National Flood Hazard Layer. The National Flood Hazard Layer. Is the <laughs> National Flood Hazard Layer. So, are you sure you want to leave this page? Yes, I want to leave this page. I really, really do want to go and search for the National Flood Hazard Okay, so there's a national flood hazard layer. Na and the national flood hazard layer is laid out by, by, by states and also by cities. Um, you have to know just quite the right way to go about pinging into this, and I know how to do that. So if you want a you know, national flood hazard layer, hazard layer for a particular area, you have to search for it by state and then by county and mess around, but you can get the data. Anything else? Any other data sets? Yes. Transmission lines of electric power. My goodness, okay. When in doubt, go to RGIS online. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so let's see what they've got to say about... Uh, sign in. Okay, so... This may be a case where some of the data is restricted too, because uh, it's also a security issue. Okay, so NIPS, that's gone back to Bing. That's not what I wanted. Oops, let me go. Well, let me, let me just in a short sense say, uh, search in RTIS online for this. And when you do that, uh, you need to search not just in what's available within the UT Austin organizational account, but there's a little box you click and it says search over all sources. Yeah, I don't, I don't know much about electric power lines, so that's the best I can do. Any other information sources you're looking for? Yes? Would the changing water levels of rivers be available to national water? Uh, change, changing <coughs> over what time scale? Um, during flood events? Yep, yes, so... Uh, the National Water Model is forecasting flows. It, probably for changing water levels, it's better to go to the um, Advanced Hydraulic Prediction System of the National Weather Service, because that works with stage heights. Um, so let's go back to our slides here. So there's a set of slides that talk about the Advanced Hydraulic Prediction System, which is the existing forecast system uh, for the country. So if you go to water.weather.gov slash ahaps, you get all these locations here with the dots, and they have information about water levels and projected water levels and so on for flooding. Any other thoughts, questions? Looks like you're all really inspired with lots of data. Let me uh, just talk a little bit about socioeconomics here, because, you know, that's not much what we... I've found it harder to get at the... Um, one, one set of data, by the way, that's really well described is land cover. So there's a land cover institute, um, there's... Uh, oh, that's all. So there's a land cover institute, there's land cover data that you can get, it's classified according to a sig consistent set of standards, um, and there's also um, changing land cover from one from 2001 to 2006 to 2011 in the um, uh, in the, the list of data sources uh, there's a link to a data 
land. Yeah, land cover changed from 2001 to 2011. This is really good if you want to say, you know, how's, how things, how's changing the, the, uh, the sort of the landscape affecting something? That this is an area of, that's really improved in recent years is capacity to answer questions about that. Um, I found the data about the uh, census is hard to get at and hard to interpret, even in ArcGIS Online, which seems like it has a lot of information, but it's hard to really interpret what it means. So uh, this is how the information is organized uh, by the US Census Bureau. It goes by states, counties, census tracts, block groups, and census blocks. And these are really tightly concentrated uh, within urban areas, and they're much bigger. Uh, well, There's about 11 million census blocks, and that's what the national census uses to count just how many people there are. You don't have socioeconomic information on census blocks, but you do have it on block groups, which are, there's a much smaller um, number of those, 220,000, and the, there's an average of 600 households in a block group, and bigger again are census tracts, but block groups and blocks are the main action. And there's something called the American Community Survey, where the Census Bureau goes around continuously sampling um, homes, 250,000 a month, three million a year, and that's how they get the socioeconomic information that's in the um, census block groups. And it's a statistical process going on all the time, and so it gets progressively more accurate with time. And you can imagine just dropping a rock from the sky and hitting a house. <laughs> and what are all the data things that you go through to do this? this? It goes through a state, it goes through a county, it goes through a zip code, it goes through a particular census block group, and then through a particular census block, gets you to a house. Uh, generally, you don't know much at this level, but you know a lot more at the census block group level. To make it easier to access, I've actually put a geodatabase um, of census block groups for the country on my website, and it's filled up with data. <laughs> uh, I did this two or three years ago, so it's, the data might not be quite up to date, but it's it gets you the geometry of the census block groups with attributes. And I, I haven't found it an easily accessible source that's comparable to this, so I just built my own and put it up there. Um, and this is what it looks like for Travis and Williamson counties, and you can see how the block groups are much more concentrated in the urban areas, and they spread out uh, once you get to the rural areas because they're supposed to count equivalent numbers of people. So you can think about, here's the counties, there's tracts, and then there's block groups uh, within the tracks. And <coughs> yeah, that's, so this is information here. So if you look in the set of slides here in the, in the listings that we provided, um, and I'm going to talk about demographics later on the semester, but if you're interested in people information and just statistics, um, this is a, a point of departure. Any other questions that you have? No, Dr. Tarleton, any final thoughts here? Um, perhaps the final thought would be that uh, one of the strengths of GIS is that it can actually integrate information from many sources. So uh, as you think of, uh, I mean, it's, it's a sort of a tool that's good for uh, helping make decisions, help learn about something by overlaying maybe rainfall that you get from one data source, stream flow you get from another data source, watershed you get from a third data source, and you end up understanding the hydrology more than you did before. Uh, population you get from the census data source, uh, land cover you get from another data source, and you sort of learn how they interact. So think about that as you go through the class and as you go through the term projects, and it's uh, sort of the, the integration of information concept. And I guess one of the things I There's learned... Quick, one yeah. There's a question over here. Okay. Uh, is, it, uh, is it possible if you get the one type of data from two different sources and we get two different things. Like precipitation from two different sources, and which one we have to trust them? Certainly, there's, there's lots of data that's inconsistent and uh, you have to use your judgment, look at the credibility of the source, uh, look at uh, what they've documented in terms of how they have put it together to, to evaluate which one to trust. Yeah, let me just make a suggestion here. So there's the global runoff, the global GLDAS, Global Land Data Assimilation System, and the National Land Data Assimilation System, NLDAS. 
and those have layers of precipitation, evaporation, f uh, flow, and so on, that are internally consistent. So that they, they may not be correct, but they're consistent. So you're not going to have you know more rain than you have. I mean more than you have uh, I mean, more, more runoff than you have rain and things like that. So there are model data collections that are internally consistent that are probably useful. Um, so one of the